and welcome to MICE, the Massachusetts Independent Comics Expo. I'm your host, Jordan Stillman, and this panel is called Democracy How? Civics in Comics. Before we get started, I want to take a minute to thank our sponsor for this program, the Center of Cartoon Studies. Located in White River Junction, Vermont, the Center of Cartoon Studies offers a two-year course of study that centers on the creation and dissemination of comics, graphic novels, and other manifestations of a visual narrative. Last year, the school published a 32-page comic book called This is What Democracy Looks Like, a Graphic Guide to Governance, which has been used in classrooms across the country to help students reach a deeper understanding of how their government works and doesn't work, and how they can make a difference in their communities and beyond. And we'd like to give a big thanks to all of our arts advocates. These are major contributors who help sustain MICE and allow the show to grow year after year. So thank you so much. MICE is produced by the Boston Comic Arts Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit charitable organization that funds comic art festivals, individual artists, and educational programs for the greater Boston community. If you like what we're doing here, please consider making a donation today using the donate button in this session. Now at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a button labeled ask a question. Please feel free to use that button to ask or vote up any questions you may have throughout the session. Also, please use that chat feature to say hello. We're so excited to see you. Finally, we'll be also be streaming this panel to our Facebook page at facebook.com slash M-I-C-E-X-P-O for audience members who would like to use the automatic closed captioning function that Facebook Live offers. And now I would like to introduce our moderator, R. Sikoriak. He's the author of Constitution Illustrated, Masterpiece Comics, Terms and Conditions, and The Unquotable Trump, Dawn, Drawn in Quarterly. And his work has appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Times Book Review, The Nation, The Onion, Mad Magazine, and SpongeBob Comics. He teaches illustration at Parsons School of Design and at the Center for Cartoon Studies. Thank you, R. Sikoriak. Please take it away. Thank you, Jordan. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning into our panel, Democracy How? <laughs> Democracy <laughs> How? I haven't figured out how to say that. Democracy How? Civics and Comics. So I think everyone feels like they need to be a good citizen these days. And uh, somehow we have, uh, I guess, obviously collected a large group of cartoonists who feel the same way. So I'm excited to moderate this panel. Uh, we have a wide range of books to talk about. So first of all, uh, I'm going to introduce our guests. Uh, Sylvia Hidalgo is the author of How to Be an American, A Field Guide to Citizenship. Born in Costa Rica, she moved to the US in 1998. She's an artist and freelance graphic designer who lives in Chicago, Illinois. Chris Linear is the author of An Anatomy of Institutional Racism. He's a cartoonist, writer, critic, and video artist based in Reno, Nevada. His work uh, is always about his fascination with visual communication. Dan Knott is a cartoonist, illustrator, editor, and educator living in Vermont. He was the lead cartoonist on This Is What Democracy Looks Like, a graphic guide to governance. Uh, and he has done comics and illustrations for a range of publications. And we also have Ali Schwed, who is a cartoonist, writer, and editor living in Belmar, New Jersey, with artist uh, Gerardo Alba. She runs Little Bird, Little Red Bird Press, excuse me, specializing in comics and printmaking. Her recent projects include uh, Fault Lines in the Constitution and her anthology Votes for Women, a comics anthology celebrating the centennial of the 19th Amendment. So thank you all for joining me, folks. Thank you. Thank and you. Happy to be here. I hope everyone is applauding at home. <laughs> so, oh, and that's me. Well, you heard about me already. I'm R. Sikoriak. <laughs> So uh, before we get into the Q&A with everybody, uh, I'd like to focus a little bit on each book. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk to each artist individually, and then we'll have a bigger conversation with everyone together. So Sylvia's book, uh, How to Be an American, is a field guide to citizenship. And Sylvia, I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about how this project gets started. Well, it started when I um, decided to uh, apply for citizenship. 
Um, I had been living here for many years and I kept on dragging the process of studying for that test. Um, and so when I, when I started uh, preparing, I picked up the material that the government uh, gives you and it is a very difficult format when it comes to learning. It's just question, answer, question, answer. Everything is disconnected. There is no storytelling. It's meant to be like memorization just for the test. And I felt that it wasn't the right way to study for something that is so important for people's lives. And also, I also felt it was not the, the right way to learn about the country you were about to become part of. I think that when you move to another country and become a citizen, you should be deeply involved in uh, what the history of the country is and what uh, uh, the democratic process and all the uh, historical, geographical, and cultural things that have that come with the package. So it felt to me that it was necessary to um, have something that could help people study for it for this test, do it in an easy way, but also be excited about the content, be and really uh, leave with a, a better understanding and not just a, a past test. <laughs> And I, I think you said in the introduction that you actually made a version of this for yourself or? Yes. Now that's fascinating. It originally, that was originally the, the plan because I had, I have a lot of uh, trouble learning um, but true memorization. I have a hard time, I have terrible memory. So um, I always, since I was in high school, I always studied with visual summaries because it was easier for me to remember and, and get excited about the content if there were jokes or uh, interesting illustrations or some form of visual reference that I could pull off later and bring the information. So um, it's, it started for myself and very soon after I, I, I think probably after the third page, I thought, yeah, this is probably better. This is going to be beneficial for other people. I just imagine, for example, like in this in this exam, this test is so complicated because it, it doesn't really matter how old you are. You could be like 65 and, and have not studied for a test in ages, and you still have to sit down and prepare for something in another language um, that will completely change your life in the, if it doesn't go the right way. So I thought a lot about people that, that had to sit down and study for the first time again after many years. And you were you were obviously an adult when you started this. <laughs> you yes. only start, you only you only became a citizen a few years ago. Correct. I became a citizen right before Trump. Um, wow. Yes. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> so just to be clear, everything in the book is what's on the test. Every um, everything in the test is in the book. And then I expanded more each of the subjects that are briefly covered in the questions. I, I wanted to make sure that people could not only learn what's supposed to be the answer to the 100 questions, but uh, have context about what happened. And then additionally to that, um, uh, I chose subjects that I thought were important, not only because I was curious about them as, as a foreigner, but also because I think they are important for Americans to read about. Like for example, um, I have a time, there's a timeline in, in the book of uh, where people came from and at what moment and from where and under what circumstances. Um, and I thought that was extremely useful to remind Americans that everyone except for uh, American Indians came from somewhere else. Right. There's a lot of detail in the book, which I really appreciated. And I I didn't have to take a citizenship <laughs> test, so there were things I certainly didn't know. Yeah, so. I, it's understandable. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm learning now, so thank you for that. Also, oh, well, there's a little bit more here. This is, this is a, a little diagram you've made of the whole process. Um, but besides this, I also just wanted to mention your other work. This is some of the graphic design work that you do. Yeah. Um, uh, yes, I, I try to do, I mean, I, I'm a regular graphic designer with regular clients, but on, on the side, my personal projects, I try to choose things that are important to me at the moment and, and 
politics have been important to me forever, uh, but now more than ever. And um, yeah, the one on the right, the one on the right is um, a button um, I did in collaboration with BC Beaver, the button um, museum here in Chicago. And in the bag is just, um, it's just a completely personal project I did after the first uh, Women's March to um, collect money for um, Planned Parenthood. That's great. Thanks. Uh, Chris, uh, Chris Linear, here's your, here's the comic that you made that we're talking about now. Obviously you've done a lot of different work, but this obviously really speaks to the moment. And how long, uh, how long were you, how long did it take you to put this um, comic together? Yeah, you know, I, I have been working on this off and on um, for a few years. Um, and, um, and obviously things really came into focus uh, with the George Floyd killing, um, where, uh, you know, where I suddenly felt like I, I really have to bring this to a closure and put it out there because there's going to be an appetite um, for this. And this this comic itself is it, um, the 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 first part of it is essentially an illustration of the Department of Justice uh, the Department of Justice investigation into the Ferguson Police Department, um, which uh, which is one of these funny things, which it's it's a government document that is actually really lucid, <laughs> lucid, well put together, and really interesting. And part, I, I think part of the reason that I wanted to illustrate um, uh, this document, and so the, the first part basically illustrates the investigation and, and the findings of the document. And then the last few pages sort of look at how that document was used in terms of trying to change policy in Ferguson itself and bringing it up to date. Um, uh, is that, you know, I, I teach at uh, Sierra Nevada University, a small uh, liberal arts college up around Lake Tahoe. And, uh, the students aren't necessarily like a cross section of an American demographic, but I, I really have been aware that um, that the uh, students really in K through 12, at least the ones that I see, don't really uh, haven't been given the tools to understand what policy is, uh, how policy affects behavior, um, and um, you know, like what Sylvia was saying, she you know she probably knows having gone through this process, <laughs> she probably has a far uh, um, better grasp of civics. And how the system is supposed to work or structured to work than than people who have been born here, um, because the educational system doesn't seem to pervasively give people the tools to unpack that. So you know there there's a um, there's a segment of this, um, and uh, th th this is a section. Um, uh, one of the big driving factors of uh, Ferguson. So is that uh, right there's structural racism built into the uh, the department in uh, Ferguson and uh, right now we live in a context where we have a current attorney general who has said systemic racism does not exist in police departments um, which is just not true um, and I think there there's a tension um, where uh, because Americans are very individualistic, they sort of break things down into individual actions. Like if something bad happens, it's because an individual police officer um, is racist, they are personally racist. And it isn't looking at, so what, what is the system and is it something that actually encourages good behavior for police officers or encourages bad behavior? And I think the system in Ferguson, which uh, it, which is literally built on on a kind of a, an extractive process, um, where the the city council wanted to budget, um, you know, wanted to increase. Uh, it, it went basically from ten percent of the city budget to twenty five percent over the period of a, of a couple of years. They budgeted to increase ticketing and citations, and so there was literally pressure from uh, uh, from the city on uh, police chiefs and police officers to ramp up citations. And, th and this is an image um, that tells the story of a person who um, was given uh, yeah, eight citations in one uh, instance, uh, several of which were uh, self-contradictory. So, th uh, so the person um, was given an expired license citation and a no license citation, which obviously you can't have both, right? Um, uh, he was cited for not wearing a seatbelt, although the car was parked. Um, this this wasn't like a, a driving, you know, moving violation, right? Um, and so and so part of this and, and and this and this actually had 
serious repercussions um, uh, for this individual. Uh, he, he lost his job, um, you know, because, um, you know, he basically had a record uh, at this point. And so th there's a point at which, like, you can't think of something more boring than municipal tax policy, um, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, you just, by the time you get to the end of the words municipal tax policy, you've probably fallen asleep. Um, but in fact, municipal tax policy drives a lot of the uh, inequitable practices in Ferguson and it has actual outcomes where people lose jobs, lose livelihoods, um, you know, people get tased, um, people get shot, uh, right? And so par part of what I wanted to do is, I, you know, I, I felt the uh, um, uh, I felt the Ferguson report gave a very lucid view in terms of how these structural things, even, even if you are a police officer who has been hired by the Ferguson Police Department and you're really going in there with an ethic of, I really want to serve this community, you're basically being pressured to be an armed tax collector in the community. And, and I think it would be very difficult, um, you know, for someone who just, you know, sincerely wants to do good to actually enact that within that context. And so, you know, what I was hoping to do was to make visible that process, which I think comics is really excellent at. You know, there, there's this kind of like fluid back and forth between, you can go from data to narrative in ways that are really powerful. Um, and, you know, in the same way that you can go to, from policy to livelihood, right? Or policy to individual story uh, in that sense. And in some ways I think comics is, is the perfect way to unpack that. Yeah, and also, you know, sort of put to what, uh, you know, Sylvia was saying, you know, th there's this potential uh, uh, educational context to government documentation where, um, you know, I mean, hopefully with the citizens test, you're not just trying to like fake people out, right? To kind of like trap them in a bad test or whatever, um, but you're actually trying to inform them about um, what is happening. And, and likewise, uh, the, the, the Ferguson report, uh, it, there's really crucial information in there, but very few people are gonna slow down and read a 100 page report. And, uh, and I think it would be sensible, this is like a cartoonist utopia thing, but right, it would be sensible when, when the government is actually trying to educate about something that this layer of visual communication is brought into it to really make it more accessible and, and more memorable um, um, you know, to, to the people who are you know, supposed to be absorbing that information. Right, one of the things you do <clears throat> in terms of layering the information that I thought was really interesting is that you actually color code it. So the blue, uh, the blue images are from the, I believe the police report. Yes. And then the red images are from the yeah. um, citizens and, yep. uh, point of view. So you can kind of like, you can visually see where all the information is coming from and, and you can see the bias uh, coming from different angles or, you know, right, at, least right. the, at least the perception from different yeah. angles. Well, yeah, and, and, and that Subjectivity. was Subjectivity. Uh, that was very much a response to um, Jeff Sessions, you know, uh, Trump's first attorney general, who basically said he hadn't read the report, you know, which again, it's, it's 100 pages. It's not like it would take him weeks, <laughs> right, to figure it out. And he made a statement that, oh, I think most of the information is anecdotal. And, and it's simply not true. Um, and so, yeah, I wanted to highlight that, that much of the really damning information about it comes from official Ferguson Department records. You know, where, for instance, um, uh, you know, somebody in the Ferguson jail was tased while they were standing uh, on top of some, uh, some bars at the, at the jail. So it wasn't on the floor. So, you know, here's a person um, who might have been being obnoxious, right, or whatever, but they weren't a threat to the officer. They were behind bars. And it's actually within Ferguson policy to say, don't tase someone when they're in an elevated position, because if they fall, they could actually get very seriously injured and, you know, perhaps even die. And so there's a record of that interaction and the use of force report that the officer filled out was approved as a legitimate use of force, even though the Ferguson policy is directly against that. And so I think framing that in terms of like that, that, that is not a piece of propaganda where, uh, or a piece of sort of subjectivity of like, oh, was he there, was he not? But all that stuff is basically, uh, yeah, being reported by the police department and, and they're not even following their own guidelines. Right, right. It's almost the opposite of uh, <laughs> subjectivity, right? Um, because you lay it out. Uh, you also, you you uh, kindly uh, use black as the color when you are <laughs> presenting your own point of view, which I thought was also very nice. <laughs> no thanks. So yeah, 
That's yeah, I, yeah. I, I mean, I sort of felt like yeah, there were some points at which I wanted to sort of editorialize it, you know, in my own. So I sort of gave gave myself, I don't know, li license to do that. I guess. Right, and and you and you let the audience know, so that's also helpful in terms of them scanning for what they want to read. <laughs> right. So thanks. Thank you. Uh, sure. We'll get back to everybody after this, but I uh, just want to introduce all, everyone's books first. So, so Dan, this is a collaborative project you did, um, the Democracy comic book, which is available for free, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yep, it's available yeah. on the Cartoon Studies website. Yeah, well, actually, I would like to talk to that, talk to everyone about that, like distribution of their work, but we'll get to that later. But I mainly wanted to just sort of have you walk us through this project a little bit. Yeah, so as you mentioned, it's a collaborative project with the Center for Cartoon Studies. There's a few other cartoonists that work on it. Um, that cover is by Kevin Chapp. Um, and I think I really love this cover. I think that they really set the tone for the comic in an important way, especially um, dealing with something that's so much talking about buildings and institutions and governments um, having people front and center right here, I think made a big difference. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in using drawing and comics to explore how we visualize and understand concepts, um, which is often through metaphor. So like, for instance, this is about how does thinking about democracy and elections as a race or a battle affect our understanding of it? Um, and yeah, in some ways, this is not as much a comic about what democracy is. Um, that's like a really big question. Uh, Astra Taylor did a really wonderful documentary um, called What is Democracy on that question that I recommend. Um, but this is more of a way of look, uh, thinking about what our government is um, because it's this really big, big idea. And it's so complex that I think we often think of it in abstract terms um, and it becomes hard for us to talk about. Um, so the idea behind this comic is to show that it's not really one big thing, but actually like thousands of different things. Um, and sometimes these different institutions are working together. Sometimes they're competing with each other. Sometimes they're democratic. Sometimes um, they're working to represent us. Sometimes they're working to repress us. Um, and I think identifying these different layers of our government is a really crucial part of um, knowing where to even put our energies. Um, so yeah, the comic goes on to look at the different layers, uh, the federal government, um, the state governments, municipal, local governments. Um, but I think a big part of um, what I wanted to do here was show that the areas that we tend to focus on in the federal government tend to be the least representative. Um, and that really where democratic ideals are their most realized and most pure are often outside of the state entirely and it's how we can sort of come together as communities and um, work together to help fill in where the government isn't doing that um, and also drawing attention to just like local governments and um, even state governments and the things that i think we're not paying as much attention to now um, especially with less and less local journalism sure sure um i uh you also sent me some images from your other works. I don't know if these are all from uh, your upcoming book or some of these are from different projects, but it seems that uh, this kind of approach to your work, uh, I mean, this kind of approach carries through your different projects. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, I think comics are great uh, to understand how we look at things. And I think they're also really good to explore the things that are hidden. Um, so for instance, like the history of mass incarceration, it's very like purposefully hidden, um, it's behind walls. Um, so using comics to explore that in like a very sort of visceral way is something. Um, I think this is actually from 2015 or 2016. Um, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so, and I think this is true when we're talking about like tech companies too, that we see companies like Google or Facebook as this screen or this interface. Um, and we don't really understand the apparatus that's behind that and how that, um, you know, how it's dealing with our data and a lot of other really important things um, having to do with our place in the community. Um, and this is from a book that I'm currently working on called Hidden Systems. Um, and this page is about how 
like the metaphors that we use to describe the internet, whether it's a highway or cyberspace or tubes, um, we sort of use all these jumbled metaphors to describe the internet. And it sort of hides the reality that the cloud is actually these like corporate or government warehouses full of our data, um, which I think is on, on the, the next slide. Um, so again, just a lot of my work revolves around this about like using comics to look into our imagination to see how we're visualizing abstract concepts and then showing how it actually works and what is actually there. Um, sometimes like with things like this in places that we wouldn't necessarily have access to. I was I was struck that this book has an image that's also like the the image in the other book of this jumble of all of these important objects crammed together. <laughs> it seems like your whole project in life is to disassemble these like poorly constructed puzzles. Uh, and I just it was amusing to me to sort of see that metaphor used twice because it applies to everything at this point we, we're <laughs> constantly overwhelmed by this. Yeah, totally. And I mean, it's, you know, so I was struck by what Chris said before about like, you know, how do you make these things engaging? Like, how do I talk about uh, like the electric grid in a way that's engaging? Um, because it's these big, it's these big abstract concepts, um, and the same as the government. That's why I, I went back to this um, sort of metaphor of these jumbled images, is because we don't really know how to think about it because it's too big. Um, so, um, using comics to pull those apart to show things like when we're using electricity, we're really burning natural gas when we're turning on a light, um, and using comics to just sort of show that process. Um, and explore that history, I've found to be like a pretty effective way of doing it. Great, thanks. Um, Allie, I, uh, hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually put in both uh, some samples from both of your books here because okay, both are so pertinent here. Thank uh, you. So uh, obviously one was self-generated and this one, um, I'm not sure how this one got started, but well, let's start here. How did this one get started? Okay. So yeah, this is fault lines in the constitution from first second is starting a new line of civics oriented comics called world citizen comics. And this was the second one to come out in the series and fault lines itself is a book written by Cynthia and Sanford Levinson that they wrote just like a, a regular book version of it. Um, a few years ago and for a second came to me and was like here's this amazing book about the constitution do you think we could turn this into a comic? And I read it in like a day and learned so much about the constitution that I did not know I didn't know. And I was just like, yes, Mark Siegel, let's turn this into a comic. And that's what we did basically. Um, so what the framework of the book that the original writers wrote in their original book, and I tried to stay very true to it because I think it worked very well, is that they would take an aspect of the constitution. And of course the constitution written in 1787 doesn't always apply in the 21st century, doesn't always apply in 1788, let's be honest. But um, so they take all these different aspects of the constitution that aren't quite working or don't quite make sense for our modern day society and our climate, socioeconomic climate and whatnot. And they give a case study of this particular aspect of the constitution, explain why it's not quite working and then try to explore different options based on what maybe states are doing on the state level, what other countries are doing in terms of that particular um, problem or issue or whatever the case may be, and just explore ways that maybe we should break from what the constitution originally put forth and see if there's a way that we could update it and modernize it. So each chapter kind of has that framework of case study, jumping back to 1787 and exploring why the framers came up with this issue, why they felt they should or should not acknowledge it in great detail, uh, and then exploring the different ways of how we could maybe make it more pertinent, more relevant, more helpful to us in modern day society. And you do jump through history. Uh, I noticed a lot of presidents are represented through the book. Yep, yeah, it, I mean, it really encapsulates very current, modern, case studies of things that happened within the past couple of years, and then jumping to things that maybe happened in more recent history of like the 50s, 60s, and then even jumping all the way back to like the 1800s. It kind of covers a lot of different case study examples and a lot of history incorporated into it, which really nails home that point of even though the constitution was written at a certain point, immediately after there were problems with it. And then 
a few decades after that, there were problems with it. So of course, in the 21st century, there's going to be issues with it. And the problem is that we're just not really talking about that. We're not really addressing them because we think we're limited by certain things in the Constitution. But when you actually do a deep dive, which this book does, you realize that, wait a second, there actually is nothing written into the Constitution saying we have to have nine Supreme Court justices. Or we actually have a little bit of wiggle room in terms of what the 25th Amendment says and can do and what Congress can do in that instance. So um, much like what pretty much everybody has said so far, comics does a really good job of taking something that's very abstract or something that we don't usually do a deep dive in. Like everybody's like, oh, I know the Constitution. Sure. But who's ever sat down and read the Constitution in its entirety, including the Bill of Rights and all the amendments and, and whatnot? Not a lot of people. Or if we did, it was in like grammar school. So this book picks out the things that we really should be doing a deep dive into and gives it a, a clear real world example of how it applies to us and then shows us how we should maybe be thinking or could be thinking about it in different ways and not just reading the constitution and saying, yes, that's it, black and white, end of story. That's not, it's not the end of the story at all. And this book acknowledges that even this book itself is not the end of the story. It's a constantly changing thing to explore the constitution and government. And we're learning that in current events right now, that there's things coming up in the constitution that we didn't know quite existed. Uh, so it's an ongoing conversation. And this book is just adding to the conversation. Right, right. I wish I had this book before I did my version of the constitution. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and I'm sure everybody could kind of agree to this with everything going on in the world. When you do books like this, you're constantly wanting to update it and be like, oh, God, this thing just happened. We need to add another <laughs> chapter or something else happened. We need to go back and adjust that. So I'm sure even looking at this book now, reading through it, there would be things that I would want to go back and rewrite, redraw, add more. Even in the course of working on the book, I worked on it for a, about a year and a half from start to finish. And in the midst of that, we had to add two new chapters to the book based on wow news <laughs> that's great that's great glad glad you got it out already otherwise yeah. you'd still be working oh on it. geez yeah seriously <laughs> that's that's how these books go you you're constantly just like we need to we need to update this we need to do more so i i don't know if this was if this was started before you started fault lines but this was the anthology that you put together which also totally fits into this theme yep yep so. definitely i i definitely have a, a niche for my work um, but this is Votes for Women, and this one's a comic anthology. So I, through my uh, small press, Little Red Bird, we got together 31 other women and then myself to write and draw comics about the 19th Amendment, because this past August was the centennial of its ratification. Uh, and the 19th Amendment, if anyone's not familiar, is the amendment that basically said that we can't discriminate based on gender. Um, in uh, franchisement, like the right to vote. Uh, so it, I always hesitate to say it gave women the right to vote because it didn't give all women the right to vote when the amendment was actually passed. Um, women of color, indigenous women still had a very, very hard time getting the vote. Some still do today, but it was a step in the right direction towards getting women uh, the vote. So this comic here was my contribution to the story. And this actually is very pertinent because it, focuses on that exact idea that we hear about suffrage very often we hear that the Seneca Falls Convention was the beginning of the suffrage movement and was the beginning of the women's rights movement but it wasn't really that wasn't the full story and the story that gets written is very much what Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B Anthony two of the like the big names in suffrage it's basically their version of the story that we usually hear because they wrote this huge tome called the history of women's suffrage and they pretty much wrote their own history into it, um, which isn't to take away from what they did because they were still very important, meaningful people to the movement, but they left out so many Afri African-American women, indigenous women who had a huge, huge part in making suffrage for women happen, but they just like got lost in the history that was told by Stan and uh, Susan B. Anthony. So that's this comic in particular, but the anthology as a whole Pretty much we tried to hit all aspects of the suffrage movement from pre-Seneca Falls to acknowledge that like, well, actually the movement got its start in uh, other countries, Great Britain in particular for the US, 
um, to today. We talk about the ERA, we talk about the um, Civil Rights Act and things that are happening in more recent history, and then focus on all of the people and the events that that happened in between, trying to give a accurate portrayal that it wasn't all just like, yay, women, they got the right to vote. It was super fun and great. And now everything's perfect. But like looking at the darker side of things that like, yeah, a lot of African American women were totally pushed to the back of the movement. And a lot of people today still don't have the right to vote. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This book could also be updated. <laughs> oh, geez, yeah, definitely. Like we were, we were limited by the like the resources and how many pages that we could actually go. But this could be a multi-volume anthology. We could put put out a volume a year and still have more to tell for sure. Well, I always love anthologies, and I I love that you've got so many different people to contribute to this book. Yeah, and that that was super important, right? Because one of the problems of this movement and many movements is that we don't hear everybody's voice. So it was very important for me when I had this idea. It actually like it started. I do a lot of comics for the Nib, the comics journalism website, the Nib, and like years ago, I'm always like thinking like three years ahead of like, okay, comics I could do for certain like moments in history. So I'm like, oh, suffrage movement, definitely need to do something for the centennial. And I'm like, wait, no, there is way more information than a single nib comic. We need more than that. So I'm like, well, maybe I could do a book. That would be great. And it, at that time I started working on fault lines. So I'm like, I alone cannot do this book. That would be crazy. So then I'm like, no, this is perfect. This is the perfect story to tell in an anthology because getting as many women's voices to tell the story of women's suffrage that just like it made so much sense so and it, it's brought out in the different styles in the book we used a um cohesive color palette we used the colors of the the women's suffrage movement which were yellow purple and white but all of the the art styles are so different and again that's so indicative of the movement itself so it just like it really on so many different levels tells the story of this this historical narrative yeah, it's it's really a great collection. Thank you. I um before we get to questions, I want to just show you a couple of images from my book. This is why I'm moderating this panel, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just I just illustrated um, the complete text of the Constitution, um, and in my usual way, I've adapted it into different comic styles. the The notion for doing this was to have all of the text available, but also use the images from different eras of comic strips to sort of suggest okay. how everyone is affected by this document. And as it evolves, uh, we also sort of see the characters uh, move through time as their costumes changes, as the, the, as the amendments are written. But um, even the earliest parts we're still grappling with. So uh, some modern characters are in the, are in the declaration and some older characters are in I'm not the declaration, excuse me, in the in the Constitution uh, preamble. And then there's some uh, older characters in the in the um, amendments, the idea that everyone is is existing under this framework. However, we want to change or, or revise it. Uh, it applies to everyone, whether uh, young or old, <laughs> as seen here. Um, so I just wanted to throw that in. Uh, <laughs> but what I want to do now is um, is sort of open up the conversation to all all four of you. Thank you so much for sharing your work. And um, I, there's a lot of big questions and I'm hoping we'll have a little time for a Q&A with the audience at the end of this. But I just wanted to start with, um, I was really interested at how all of you kind of come to this material from very different places. Some of you have like very personal experiences. Some of you uh, are working with a collective to make this work. Can you talk about how this work uh, came to be and, and, and what drew you to it maybe? If you haven't already covered it. <laughs> Dan, you wanna jump in? Sure, um, yeah. So James, the director of the Center for Cartoon Studies had asked me to work on this comic with um, a few other people as sort of consulting on it. Um, and, you know, there's so many different ways to approach the subject as everyone on this panel has already shown. So I was really trying to think of like, what um, specifically can I bring to this? Um, like, what about my way of thinking about things and my drawing style can be useful for people. Um, and when I was like doing research, I remember going to like the Dartmouth Library, which is by here and 
um, going to like look at the shelves of books on democracy and just seeing that there was like so many books written on the ideas of democracy, but that it was actually kind of hard to find just like a quick guide to like how things are set up. Um, that you can like look at various different websites and see that, but there wasn't, it didn't really all exist in one place. Um, so that was sort of how I decided to go about um, this comic with this specific approach. Um, and then we got another couple of cartoonists, um, Haley J. Pope and Summer Pierre to do comics at the end um, to bring in a few other little voices as well um, about um, different topics. And this was distributed through the school, that's correct? Yeah, so it was it was published by the school and um, distributed through Diamond um, and a few other um, organizations that we worked with that brought it to schools. And they, we also came up with a way to present it in classrooms that involved doing live drawing and asking questions and giving students a problem that they had to solve um, and then sort of brainstorming different ways of mapping out like who how they could go about solving that problem. Um, so we did this with a cartoonist named Coco Fox, uh, and she did like a really wonderful job um, doing this sort of graphic facilitation model of working with students to figure out how they can solve their own problems in their day-to-day -day life outside of politics. Great. Well, that kind of leads into my next question, which again is for anyone. Uh, maybe, Ali, you'd want to take this in terms of like distribu distributing the work, getting the work out there. Um, uh, some of you have posted the work online. Ali, I know you did a Kickstarter for the mm -hmm. for the Votes for Women book. Can you yeah. can you talk about putting that project together? Yeah, definitely. Um, so through my small press, through Little Redbird, we that's how we publish our work. That's how we get our funding for publishing. Is that we've done Kickstarters for all of them. We've done ki seven Kickstarters now at this point for ten books, including Votes for Women, which was our most recent one that we did this year. Um, so that has become our, our initial source of distribution for that book. But now that it was published in August, right in time for the, the uh, centennial. So now we're just we're sending it out there to as many places as we can. It's available on our website. And I think one of the biggest things that I always like to focus on when we do one of these anthologies is to give as many copies as I can to the creators of the book so that they could get it out to their networks as well. Because I know like we are a small press for a reason. We only have so much outreach through Little Red Bird itself. And this book, we're actually, we're getting a lot, we're reaching a lot of shops. It's on on Common Goods. The Nib bookstore has it. A lot of comic shops are now carrying it. But um, I think it's super, super important for all the artists who actually worked on this book to reach out to their networks as well. Because uh, a lot of the women who worked on this book, they also do comics journalism. They also work on books very much in this realm, but they are able to reach outlets that I don't, I don't personally have a connection to. And that was very, very important for me is to make sure that they were able to get it out as well. And then Fault Lines, that went through for a second. So that one, um, the distribution of that one is uh, pretty much wherever fine comics are sold. But I know the focus that that world citizen, they're really trying to focus on schools and libraries uh, mm -hmm. to get it out through that. Well, working with a bigger publisher certainly makes a difference in terms of how the work gets out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sylvia, I actually wanted to sort of talk to you about that as well. Like when you were making your book, I mean, when you were making your first version for yourself uh, before you pitched it to a publisher, you might not have imagined what your audience would be. Have you heard back from your audiences? Did, did, did you get the response you hoped for? Uh, yeah, in a lot of cases, um, more in like a one-to-one -one basis, um, uh, especially with people that already did the test and were able to use the, the book to study. Yeah, I, I got really nice comments about how it made a difference in it, the way the information was laid out and explained. So it, yeah, I feel like, I, I mean, I, I don't, don't want to sound like I was already confident, but I felt that we're, from where we were coming from, it, it was going to be an improvement in the process, uh, no matter what. <laughs> right, sure. <laughs> I'm sure it was. <laughs> yeah, it was definitely, it, it, I think it, it, um, I think it's, it, it's interesting how the, um, I remember seeing a TED talk from a person in Portugal who was 
in the process of redesigning the documents of the government. And she was directly working with different entities in the government. And I thought, how great would it be if other countries had that effort? It, 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 going back to going back to the whole idea of like helping people understand processes, helping people break up, up an institution, for example, into pieces and understand how it works. I think that one of the biggest value values of a lot of the of the comic material that we saw today is that it definitely take people into consideration and the way we learn and the way we understand things. Um, we've been collectively, particularly like government documents and things like that, walking away from being clear and straightforward and transparent. So yeah, I think it's wonderful if you can if, if we can all like help make things more accessible. Yeah, I think if I could just kind of tag on to that, Sylvia, you said like something that was just, it kind of encapsulates it, the way that people learn. And a lot of the, the informational documentation that's out there is not in a format in a way that people learn, whether it's younger readers, older readers, whatever, it's like it's in either language that is not very accessible or it's just not in a format that people want to read and therefore they won't learn the information. So comics definitely, is a much more digestible, accessible format that really helps a lot of different learning styles. Like a lot of different readers and a lot of different learning styles could get something out of reading a, a comic format. Yes. Yeah. There's so many, <clears throat> oh, sorry. sorry. There's so many layers of information implicit that you don't even have to write with words or or, or it's amazing. It's so human. It's yep. Yeah, it's very, it's a very deep medium. Yeah, you know, and, and I think there's, there are also uh, openings for people who don't even identify themselves as cartoonists to communicate through that uh, <laughs> uh, method. Yeah, I, I've uh, been part of a, a comics and medicine conference, which brought cartoonists together with medical professionals, um, you know, who have to think about, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, communicating complex information to patients. Or even uh, I, I went to a, a a conference called Sketching in Practice, which was um, bringing uh, the one presentation there that I really remember was somebody who worked in uh, the Canadian Immigration Office, and they were trying to identify what sort of information that new immigrants were using to kind of understand the whole process of uh, 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 of uh, and, and not just naturalization, but just kind of general processes. And they went through this exercise of having um, the the people that they interviewed instead of just doing a verbal interview. To have them draw a map of their information sources, and oh, and they yeah. found and they found that right. And these are not people who had training as cartoonists, uh, but they found that the information they got was really richer um, because they were sort of doing it themselves, and it had this visual uh, um, this visual layer to it that they could then kind of interrogate and and find more information from. Yeah, and I mean right. having that visual that's going to stick in your mind, like you might not be able to memorize all the names of the founding fathers, but you're going to see Mr. Weatherby as a founding father and be like, I'm going to remember him, right? So that it just makes sense. It, it's great that way. Yeah, and that's what uh, really inspired me about Sylvia's work is that it, your, your book started as a way of you drawing to learn. And for me, that's like, that's how I learned too. I learned by drawing. And I know that there's a lot of other people like that. And I think by doing this type of work where we're learning ourselves by drawing we're also like encouraging other people to use this method um, to learn and i know that was something that we tried to do in the in the workshops for this comic um, but I, I would love to see just taught in schools more um, instead of so being so focused on writing well it's, it's something that i'm always kind of uh, trying to impress because it's funny because there's some students who um, want to be designers and maybe they feel like they don't have drawing chops so they're sort of hesitant about actually drawing and, you know, I think this thing has been lost um, where it's like drawing is thinking, like you don't have to be Michelangelo to do it, but it, it's, it, you can actually iterate and think through a process through that practice. And, uh, and I feel that just by whatever, like pulling, like drawing an art out of the kind of K through 12 curriculum, mm -hmm. you, you're actually depriving students of thinking tools that they could have at their disposal. Chris, I, I'm sorry, uh, Chris, I also, along those lines, I kind of wanted to follow up with you a little bit as well. Um, you had sent me a lot of the inspirations that you used for putting your book together. 
And I was really struck by you were pulling from graphic design, you were pulling from like very political comic, uh, comic book stories. And um, I think something about all these books is they're really different in terms of the way they treat the material. And, and Chris, I was kind of curious for you what the process was of like sifting through those those different uh, approaches. Yeah, I, I, the, the three sort of uh, inspirations that, that I sort of flagged were, um, uh, one was the uh, uh, murals uh, and book illustrations of Aaron Douglas, uh, you know, from the uh, uh, Harlem Renaissance, who, who um, basically um, uh, depicted uh, images from African-American history with through these silhouetted um, figures. And I, <laughs> what, the one danger of um, uh, talking about your influences is when they're better than you, you know, it makes you look pretentious. <laughs> um, but, but, but he had this whole, whole very beautiful kind of like silhouetting style that I thought, uh, you know, particularly when I'm uh, depicting things that I don't have photographic reference for. So these interviews um, that were done that you know, nobody was photographing about. That this idea of silhouetting gave uh, was sort of tipping the hand to oh like th this isn't necessarily like exactly you know whatever somebody's elbow might have been positioned differently I don't know what clothes they were wearing and the silhouette kind of gave me access to um, tipping the hand to that that there's a, a level of interpretation there uh, but also yes yeah, uh, Seth Tabachman's War in the Neighborhood I, I think is one of the great um, sort of political graphic novels that hasn't been if for some reason it seems to have sort of fallen off the radar, but it's just an, an amazing blend of kind of ideology and reportage and personal narrative um, that I thought was implicit in, in that Department of Justice report. And then um, yet uh, W.E. Du Bois's um, uh, infographics that he made around the turn of the century, where, where he, um, they're absolutely beautiful aesthetically, but uh, he, in terms of being in a Department of Sociology, really wanted to track uh, difficulties that African Americans were having even after emancipation, um, you know, during that kind of transition from emancipation to um, the reconstruction process. And uh, it, it, sociology was a new art, right, a, a, a new practice, a new discipline at that point. And, but he understood, but he felt that, right, like this layer of data, which we are swimming in even more so now, right, this layer of data is what makes kind of political reality comprehensible. Um, and, and, and just, yeah, just the particular beauty and the handmade quality of, um, uh, uh, of those illustrations was something that I really responded to. Yeah, well, all of, and I, and just to reiterate, uh, I think all of these books do a great job of, of approaching this material from, from really distinct ways. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions and, uh, Jordan, are you there? Can you uh, maybe read the questions in the chat if there are any? I sure can. Um, all right. Yeah, we've got a few questions here. So let's start with this one from uh, Shelley. What was the hardest abstract concept for each of you to visualize in comics? That's a good one. I would say for myself, some of the some of the uh, sentences in the Constitution are very long, and even if you're only running one sentence on a page and you're trying to illustrate it, and there's twelve clauses, sometimes just drawing a crowd scene that somehow implies enough of the different characters who might be involved in the situation while still getting a a, a nice image across uh, was really daunting. <laughs> Yeah, I definitely, I mean, also working with the Constitution, that was something that in the original version of the book, since it was a book and you could, I mean, it was easy for them to just add more pages on, they had huge chunks of quoted Constitution in it. And I know the writers really wanted that in the comic. And I'm like, no, if it's already <laughs> like, there's already, already too many words in this book. So like finding a way to, well, how do we still capture that, but put it into a visual format? Um, it, it was hard to just kind of just narrow down the text because like inherently these books are going to have more text than your average comic book is going to have because they have to they have to have more text um but it's finding that that balance of like well where can we reduce the text and rely on images i honestly i can't think of one single thing that is like oh that was the hardest but overall it's a hard thing to do to narrow it down and make sure that you're not overwhelming it with text but you're still giving enough information but then also at the same time thinking that like well i'm not just rewriting the constitution and i'm not like writing a textbook about the constitution so what what information maybe could we even pull out because it's something that's inherent in everything else that i'm talking about 
Yeah, uh, I know. I know that for me, I was, we only, you know, this is what democracy looks like was a, a free 28 page comic. And I was like very limited to that page count. And I remember having like one and a half panels to explain the electoral system. And I was just like, <laughs> like over and over again, I was just rewriting it and rewriting it, trying to like find some way to even just capture its essence in that amount of space. And it was, I remember that as being the hardest part. <laughs> I would say the same thing uh, as Dan. Uh, the, the whole electoral process was very complicated for me to wrap my head around. I still today read my own page, and I'm not sure I can just explain it to you, <laughs> even if I read it. So, yeah, it's it's sometimes it's very tricky. It's a lot of information. But yeah, it, it, and I think it's I mean interesting that uh, I mean so many of us have kind of adapted a pre-existing text. And uh, it's certainly a process that, that I don't feel like editors are outside of comics. Like it's, it's, we're sort of dealing with like, oh, hey, this panel will look better if there's like one less line break, right? We're, we're dealing with it as a design element, right? Mm -hmm. And so you're like, oh, are there, and, and it's amazing when you do that, like what words can you condense? What words can you get away? And you realize how much of communication is sometimes uh, redundant, mm -hmm. um, you know, because, you, because you're very motivated to kind of clip, uh, you clip things out so that the visual balance is right. Yeah, and it's hard when if you're used to writing comics and thinking about like narrative and pacing and like numbers of panels per page, but then you're working with an original text that you're like, well, I still need to get this much information, making sure that you're balancing out, like getting all the information in there, but still having that narrative flow and have the pacing be good and have page turns work the way you want them to and whatnot. That's, that's it doesn't always fall into place the way that you want it to. So you have to be like extra creative to find that balance. Yep. All right, awesome. All right, next question. Uh, given your experiences making these important works, and, and this is Ash who asked this, uh, what would you carry forward into future projects and what would you do differently? There's also some uh, interest in what you're taking, on, inter what you're interested in taking on next. Well, uh, uh, yeah, I would, uh, I, I, I'll jump in. I uh, I, I, I can't um, say um, too uh, uh, much about this because it's still in uh, I'm, I'm in the midst of doing a proposal um, around this work. Um, but uh, but yeah, I, I think part of this, and it, it also sounds like this is a common thing, is like this sense of like you can build on it and expand upon it. I'm currently putting together a proposal for an anthology that would look more deeply into kind of activism and policing. Because, you know, it feels like, oh, you crack this nut over here about how, like how policing goes wrong here. And then, but what can you add to that? Can you add a story about, um, you know, whatever, a police department, um, like in Richmond, California, where they actually had some success in uh, in reimagining that police department in a way that worked both for the community and for the police. And and, and so I, I, I'm sort of interested in, in um, building on this in terms of, you know, if, if you can make uh, 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 an institution understandable in this way, that that institution is going to connect up to other institutions and, and it feels like, you know, it could be endless. I guess uh, on, on a similar point, I'm, I'm interested in using this same sort of approach to look at policing um, in a similar way that I guess uh, that Chris is talking about, but just like looking at, there's so many different layers of policing and law enforcement in this country and like actually visualizing all of that, um, I think is a really important thing for people right now. Well, the next book that I'm working on, which is gonna be another one for the World Citizens line of comics is about democracy but specifically comparing it to other forms of government and seeing why those other forms, whether it's like aristocracy, theocracy, oligarchy, whatever, where how they work in different contexts and how democracy functions in light of those and in spite of those. Um, and that's, that's a book that I'm working on right now. And that one takes a little bit more of a narrative approach, I would say to it, that it kind of has a framework of these two characters kind of guiding you through. And that's something in future projects that I want to focus on even more. Um, this one is definitely like a non-fictional book, but I would love to work on a project down the line that takes on these heavy topics, but in a fictional context so that it is just like a straight narrative, like a beginning, middle and end kind of story, but it's still tackling these issues that they're just infused into the narrative so that it's not so much of a didactic comic as it is just like subconsciously, you're going to be picking up on these 
threads and themes, but it's within a, a narrative that's kind of like it's hidden in there. And I would love to explore some kind of story um, with that. In terms of the topic, I'm not sure because right now I'm focused on this democracy book, but um, that, that's on the to-do list. <laughs> Five-year plan. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have any projects. I, I definitely, I'm, this was my first book and I was not expecting it. And I, I, I think I'm excited to think of other things to come, but I, I don't have any other projects of the same kind coming in the future. One of the things that I just like love about uh, all of the work that everyone is doing here is that once you develop this kind of approach, you can just sort of apply it to whatever you think is interesting or whatever you think that people really need to know more about. Um, like right now I'm learning about water systems and like how um, like people get fresh water. Um, and that's like the chapter of the book that I'm working on now. Um, so it just feels like there's sort of unlimited things to look into um, once you have sort of a model for doing it. Yeah, because it could be super intimidating to take something. Well, I mean, like the Constitution or uh, any of this that it's like it's such a huge, huge topic. And that goes that kind of brings us full circle to what we were saying in the beginning. But once you do do it, you're like, yeah, what topic can I tackle next? Like nothing, nothing can stop me now. So, yeah, I, I definitely second that. All right, I think we have time for one more. We're a little over, but let's let's do it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> this question is from from Laura. Um, Laura asks, "Did you all have an interest in civics apart from comics, or did it come from the desire to understand and illustrate these concepts?" I could start with that one because um, I definitely. Well, I guess I did have a root in it. My undergrad degree was in English Lit and American Studies, with more of a focus on the American Studies side of things. Um, and then when I went to grad school for art, I remember writing in my like entrance essay that you have to send them like, eventually I want to do political cartooning and editorial cartooning, but I don't know how to draw. So let's focus on that first. <laughs> and once I was like, so focused on drawing, I kind of forgot about that side of things. But I remember specifically the moment where I got back into it, um, when the Pulse nightclub shooting happened, I was living in Mexico at the time. So I was going through this weird, like stuff is happening in the US, which is my home country, but I'm living in this other country. And I just felt this like weird, I don't know what to do to help. Um, and that specifically when the, the shooting happened, I was just like, I, I don't know how to handle this emotional feeling inside of me. So I drew a comic about it and it helped me process it. And I shared it with a few people and I helped them process it also. And I was like, that was a good feeling that helped me. It helped other people. How can I do more of this? And then it just kind of snowballed into I started doing stuff for the nib and now these books and now that I've done it I'm like this is this is I figured it out this is what I want to be doing it just like it works it feels good the end <laughs> in my case um there was a part of like uh the desire of problem solving that comes from a, like being a graphic designer like you identify a problem and you know you have a solution and you know it's it's gonna work um but there is also the other, the personal part. I, I, I was born in Costa Rica and uh, in Costa Rica, politics are a very important thing and everyone talks about them and everyone learns to disagree. And the process of voting is very festive. Everyone goes out, it's very open, it's very engaged. Um, you start getting excited about voting when you, when you're very little and you, and it's one of the things that you want, you want to grow up so you can vote and also drink beer, but, but vote. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think that for me, that part was particularly important or, or it made a big difference because I, I feel that I was always surprised on how election time would come to, uh, uh, to the United States, come and go. And it was always so quiet and so, under the rug in <laughs> the process. It just felt always like nobody's talking about it. You only see this prefabricated material on TV that is so such a the, the ugly side of politics. And there's no celebration. There's no it, it, politics don't belong to the people in the United States. Like it, it voting doesn't belong to the people. And um, I think that I used to miss uh, the excitement of voting every every four years, and it felt to me that uh, part of it probably has to do with the disconnect of politics and, and American citizens. And so, 
I thought it was particularly important to to go more fanatic on on the material. <laughs> um, the people will benefit. We're going to benefit from it. Yeah, well, there's your next book idea, Sylvia. Getting people <laughs> excited about voting yes. and also learning Make how to disagree with each other. I think it's yes. huge that like huge. that's a skill that Americans do not have at all. We disagree and we shut down and we're yeah. just like, nope, I'm right, you're wrong, the end. And that I would love to read that book. <laughs> I, I feel that I feel like I gotta say, I feel in like Costa Rica, we're now in the same mode as er, the rest of the world where we're just disagreeing and but I think that we have a we have a, a long history of having family members that are like swinging their flag in front of your face, and you just have to be okay with it because it's part of the game. Well, and and I, and I do think that conflict, like this, this is one of these things that I, I think is sort of a hidden process or, or a hidden policy or hidden systems where, um, you know, social media in particular. Um, it has has basically it's not the only piece of the puzzle, but you know essentially has gotten people into bubbles. It feeds people misinformation based on their um, uh, <laughs> what they're angry about, um, and and it, it really has uh, it really has divided that. Just just and and that's because of algorithms, right? Like this this idea that oh engagement is what counts, and so and people get engaged when they get upset about things. So we're going to basically feed them upsetting things to their. Um, Probably, you know, to, to inflame them in terms of what media channel, right? They're they're plugged into, and um, and for me, just to go around to the the question, like in terms of process, like I, I sort of feel like my engagement with this is is this interest in, in process. I was, I was talking to uh, John Jennings, uh, you know, the uh, excellent uh, cartoonist, and he said, you know, capitalism hides process, and I think I think it's also true of what. Soviet communism, right, and also technology. Going back to Dan's image of the Google platform, and you're not being aware of what's behind that, right? Um, and you know, we we live in systems that hide the process. Um, and to me, trying to address this stuff is like trying to understand where I'm at. You know, trying to understand the processes that have led me and led us, right, as a country, to where we're at. Um, and and uh, you know, because because I feel like <laughs> there are vested interests that hide us in terms of the conditions that have gotten us to where they are. So that, that, that's been, you know, part of, I guess, a, a, a personal motivation to get into this sort of stuff is just to understand that. Yeah, I would say it's, it's been kind of the same for me. Um, and like Ali, I also like really was interested in political cartoons, which is, I think, probably how I got so interested in metaphor. Um, but really what motivates me is just this like sense of amazement of how little I know about like just like <laughs> the most basic stuff. Um, and part of that was like I studied political science in college and 10 years later, like there was still basic stuff about how our government was set up that I didn't know. Because reading the news every day, it doesn't tell you that sort of basic um, structural knowledge. Um, or, you know, you're just sort of like seeing current events. Um, so a lot of what motivates me is like thinking about these basic things that we don't know, but really should, um, like where our electricity is coming from, or like how water works or things like that. Um, and I get really excited when I finally learn these things, because um, once you have that knowledge, it's really with you and it stays with you. Um, and then I just sort of hope that the sense of discovery comes through uh, for other people in the work. That's great. Well, that's a good place to end it, I think. Jordan, unless I forgot anything. No, nope, uh, that's that's it. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks again to Sylvia Hidalgo, Chris Linear, Dan Knott, and Ali Schwed. This was awesome, everybody. Uh, thanks for watching. And thanks to MICE. Everybody at MICE is doing a great job putting these things together. Uh, please go and read some comics. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you all as well in the audience for coming to order our panelists books from Paper Asylum, which is a local independent comic shop. Please find links on our website by clicking the button below on your screen. I know I want to read every single one. So we're going to jump into that as soon as possible. And you should too. Uh, this session is part of the month of mice, a month of free comics programs, including panel discussions and workshops. If you're interested in this topic, you may also want to check out Comics of Conflict Confronting History next Saturday at 2 o'clock p.m. And just added to our schedule on Thursday, October 22nd, we'll be hosting Remembering John Lewis, a conversation with Andrew Aiden and Nate Powell, his collaborators on March. 
For a full list of sessions, visit MiceExpo.org. That's M-I-C-E-X-P-O dot org. And check out our fundraising raffle where you can win cool prizes like a tote bag full of books from Drawn and Quarterly and a Wacom One tablet. Now stay tuned to watch our Creator Showcase, a virtual exhibition floor where you can discover dozens of brand new self-published comics. Thank you all so much.